due to overwhelming demand, thank you, the one commenter who asked, um, I'll do a bit of a dive into this OPA615 uh, transconductance amplifier. But I'm going to start with this guy here. If you've done any work with audio stuff, audio synthesis, um, you've probably come across this guy, the LM13700, dual operational transconductance amplifier. Um, and this is the symbol you've probably seen. It looks like an op amp with some diodes here and a, a bias input there. And this weird loop-de-loopy -loopy thing here with another uh, amp bias input. Um, so it kind of looks like an op amp with some extra stuff. So what is a transconductance trans amplifier? Well, an op amp um, takes the difference between the plus and the minus and outputs a voltage representing that difference. Um, transconductance uh, means you're going from voltage to current. So you know, a transconductance amplifier is its simplest form. Um, can I draw sideways? Yeah, why not? Um, let's say you've got some transistor here. You've got a resistor here going into the base. Um, voltage goes in here. Resistor turns it into a current. The uh, conductance uh, of the resistor of the transistor changes, and you have some current flowing through here. Um, so how is this different from a transistor? Well. Um, it's designed to be uh, quite linear in, in the region uh, that it operates at. Um, and also the uh, relationship, uh, there's probably an equation here. Um, I only printed out the first couple of pages of this. But basically the output, um, the relationship between the voltage difference and the current out is settable by changing the bias here. Um, so why am I not using this part uh, for video? This is an 89 cent part. I just checked online a second ago. The reason why you don't use it for video um, is here. It has an open loop bandwidth of two megahertz. Very good for audio applications, not good for video applications. Just as a reminder, PAL is like four and a half megahertz uh, pixel clock. Um, well, not pixel clock, but yeah, um, you get what I mean. So, you know, it's not going to do PAL. It's definitely not going to do HD video. So that's where you get into chips like this. Uh, this is a $20 chip. Um, we don't need the rest of these data sheets. We're just going to look at this one. So this is a, a dual operational transconductance amplifier. Um, so is that one. Uh, but it's, it's designed for quite a different purpose. And you'll see the uh, sort of overview of, of, of um, the schematic of the pinout looks a little different. Um, let's look at the features. Very low propagation delay, under 2 nanoseconds. Bandwidth, 710 megahertz for the OTA, 730 megahertz for the comparator. Um, yeah, so this is a, a high speed, high bandwidth chip. Um, what you see in the block diagram is you see an SOTA, they call this their sampling operational transconductance amplifier and then uh, an OTA here, which is the Operational Transconductance Amplifier. Um, and it looks sort of like a transistor symbol, but rather than just having an arrow going in, in or an arrow going out, as you'd have for NPN or PNP, it's got arrows going both ways. Um, what this part here corresponds to is this part here. Um, and they call it base collector and emitter, as if it is a transistor. Um, but it's basically a, an operational transconductance amplifier because you put a base current in here and then a current will flow between the emitter and collector and as is somewhat sort of signified by these two arrows uh, that current can flow in either direction. You know if you're doing this circuit here where you've got um, a resistor going into a transistor um, the you know the the, the gain um, or the the yeah the, the gain effectively um, is set by the difference here between what's between your base and your emitter. And if this is floating around or this is moving in other directions, you need to have the biasing right and it doesn't work so well for, for, for signals going back and forth like that. Um, oversimplifying, but yeah. Um, this is designed to allow data, data um, signals to flow from the emitter and collector and vice versa. So that's sort of this part here. Um, there is also a biasing circuit which has this IQ adjust which is similar to uh, the bias current adjust there. In fact, the, this pin here is not present in the VSOP package which is the package I happen to have. Sorry, there's a dog chewing on a shoe back here. Um, 
hopefully that's not too loud. Um, so I don't actually use that pin because I don't have it in my package. Then over here you have this SOTA. This symbol here again looks like um, an op amp. They call it in the features a comparator. If you look further into the data sheet, they say it's, um, what do they say? Da, da, da. They said, yeah, sampling comparator. Uh, so consists of an operational transconductance amplifier, a buffer amplifier, and a subsequent switching circuit. So the first two bits, bits are here. So it takes a plus and a minus input. Then it goes to a switch, which is controlled by this switching stage. When hold control is high, that switch gets closed. All right, so th there's um, a lot of things you could potentially do with this, but the name's sort of in the title. Um, the main goal is in the title, DC restoration circuit. That's what I'm using it for. That's what this chip was designed for. These are critical components for building DC restoration. So let's have a look and take a tour. As I mentioned, there are two packages um, in the larger SO14 package. You get this IQ adjust in the smaller package you don't. Um, I think I bought the smaller package because I couldn't find any of the larger ones. So such is life. Data, data. Um, all right, Chew has been rescued from puppy. Um, yeah, lots of interesting diagrams here. Um, I don't know if I'm gonna go through any of these because I'm trying to keep this to be a quick video. Um, let's start looking at some of the circuits. So what they do in this data sheet that I like is given that you're typically familiar with what a transistor does, uh, they give you a transistor circuit, then show you the equivalent circuit in um, OTA land using the OTA component. Um, so here you see a common collector amplifier. We have a signal coming to the base um, and your voltage coming out here. And you see the equivalent circuit set up over here. And they give you the equation for gain, um, common base amplifier. Did I skip a page? I think they have the third one. Yeah, a common emitter amplifier. Like this is um, what you'll typically see. So these are the ways you can use this. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Sampling comparator. Um, how to use that. All right, DC restoration. So they present um, two main different types of circuits here for DC restoration. Uh, there's this complete DC restoration system, this DC restoration of a buffer amplifier. The only two difference between these circuits is here, they include these two resistors allowing you to get a gain um, here, much like you'd have uh, in a transistor circuit, you can get your gain that way or in an, uh, an operational amplifier. Um, let's see how this circuit works. So you have your voltage coming in here, goes into both sort of a decoupling capacitor, but also a hold capacitor. You'll see it specified as C hold. Um, signal, let's ignore this part for a second. Signal comes in here, gets turned into a current via uh, that resistor. Then signal goes out here and you get the output being V in times R2 over R1. But then you have this second part of the circuit going on up here where you have pin seven, which is that hold control thing, which is turning on and off the switch inside the front of this um, uh, sampling OTA. You have a reference voltage of ground here. Whenever that is high, it takes the difference between ground and what the tap from the output is and holds that or puts that out here, which charges the other side of this C hold to be at that voltage. So if you're sending this pulse positive every time you're at um, uh, either the blanking interval or some interval that you want to be zero volts, um, you're taking the difference between what the signal is actually at and you're resetting the other side of this capacitor to do that, uh, to, you know, to, to reference it to ground because that's your reference there. Um, that's this same circuit here but without those amplifying resistors. Um, they say not to use that one because um, uh, for either of these circuits to operate properly, the source impedance needs to be low, such as the one provided by the output of a closed loop amplifier, um, which would probably be fine for what I'm doing. Um, but the second circuit here, uh, the clamped RF video amplifier, um, has the same two components from the OTA, um, from the OPA615, but set up in a different configuration, but it includes another op amp. This is not inside the package of the chip that you get. And in my circuit, I'm not actually using this OPA6556. I'm using 
the AD8037, um, but you should also look at the 8036. I'll get to why in a second. Um, let's have a look through how this circuit works. So here we have, um, just looking at the op amp here, we have another uh, AC coupling uh, uh, capacitor and a resistor here. This forms a high pass filter that goes into the op amp. In the feedback path of the op amp, there's a 300 ohm resistor there and a 300 ohm resistor going to ground. So again, if we sort of draw a dotted line around here, all this bottom half of the circuit is, is a voltage follower with a gain of two. Um, well, an amplifier with a gain of two and this high pass filter here. Uh, so what's that doing for us? Uh, why, we, why do we have a gain of two? Um, why is this gonna be useful for us? Well, uh, for a non-inverting amplifier uh, configured like this with a feedback path like that, the amplification that you get um, is equal to, sorry, I'm sideways. So the gain is equal to one plus RF on RI. Me drawing that right there like that totally is helpful. It just looks like a scroll. But our RF is 300, RI is 300. So that over that is equal to one and generally one plus one is equal to two. So we have an amplifier with a gain of two. Um, I'm gonna pause for a second and talk about why 300 ohms. Like if it's that divided by that, any two numbers that are the same will give you two. Um, like you could pick 100 ohms, 100 divided by 100 is one. 1,000 ohms, 1,000 by 1,000 is one. These values are, are, are very important in terms of absolute value, um, especially when you're in the high frequency domain. Um, this chip, as I mentioned earlier, is designed to go north of 700 megahertz. Um, even in video signals, HD video signals, we're in the sort of 200 megahertz range. Um, these values are still important. Um, the difference between the 8037 and the 8036, and I actually haven't looked up the data sheet to, to, to this amp, uh, but the difference between 8037 and the 8036 is the 8037 is optimized for stability above a gain of two. Um, if you take an LM741 or 358 or standard sort of audio op amp, you can pick and choose whatever resistor values you want to get whatever gain you want within reason. When you're in high frequency land, um, stability um, and stray capacitance and the capacitance between the leads coming off the package to the board, um, it, it all matters. And so there's you know, there's a capacitor effectively, parasitic capacitor here, there's a parasitic capacitor here, you have inductors, are these, you know, your traces are all inductors, there's capacitance to ground, there's, you know, a whole bunch of stuff that you don't have to consider um, in low frequency design that you have to consider in high frequency design. And so the makers of these chips set up a target gain where they're stable. Um, and so for the three, seven, it's two or greater. And for the six, it's one. Um, and also, they specify in the data sheets uh, what resistors give you optimal compensation for these parasitic elements that are likely to be in your circuit. And so actually for the AD8037, I think I'm using uh, not 300 ohms, but 274 ohms for you know, a variety of other chips that I use that are sort of in this category of high-speed op-amp. Um, I've used a variety of different things that are just recommended in the data sheet. So, that's sort of just this boring part of the circuit. The interesting part of the circuit is all messy now, thanks to my scribbles. Um, but what we're doing back here is we're likewise taking a sample of the output, comparing it against, you could tie this to ground if you want to sort of bias or have your, you know, your hold be at ground, but it lets you set up whatever you want. So, sorry, loud dog again has found the other shoe. Um, so you can set whatever your voltage reference is. It'll take the difference of it whenever there's a high pulse on pin seven, and it'll use that to charge this hold capacity here. That then feeds into this OTA, um, which is tied to ground here and allow current to flow in either direction um, back into this node point between these two 300 ohm resistors. What that's effectively doing is it's changing the offset point um, around which this is amplifying. If you tied, brought this all the way up to one volt, you'd have a one volt offset at the end. Tied this down to, well, it effectively is tied to zero here through this resistor. Um, that means it's reference zero, but you can tie it up and tie it down by biasing that node um, in what effectively is a voltage divider in the feedback of the op amp circuit. Um, it's interesting though that they've specified these sort of 100 ohm values, but they have not specified what C hold is. They have not specified what that is, what that is. 
or RE. And that's where some trial and error came into it. Um, they talk about sort of the external capacitor C hold allows for a wide range of flexibility. One of the problems that you have when you're doing um, uh, you know, this sort of clamping, let's go back to finding a diagram of a video signal. Yeah. One of the issues that you have is you want to charge a capacitor up you know, to either some reference value. One sec, dog is being loud. What you want to do um, in the sort of, well, in the circuit here where you're charging up a capacitor, but you're effectively doing that here, you want this capacitor to charge up fast enough um, to hold the reference value that you want it to hold. Um, but you also don't want it to decay quickly with sort of that, you know, characteristic sort of time constant that comes from the resistance loading down that capacitor uh, before it can get charged up again. So there's a bit of a balancing act depending on how much time there is between one, the start of one line and the start of the next line, because this is the time period here um, when you're setting this value on the capacitor. You want to sort of balance the drain from that capacitor with the time that it takes to charge so that there's enough time for it to charge during this period with enough current and the current drawdown during the horizontal line doesn't cause the voltage to droop significantly. Um, and I can't remember what value I ended up with. I think um, it was 0 0.1. Let me just check my circuit diagram, one sec. All right, so you'll see here in my schematic, hopefully it's not too glary, um, I didn't specify the values for C hold, CB or RB, but you'll see, or RE, but my, I've got some notes here in blue. So I've actually gone with 560 puff uh, for this uh, uh, capacitor. Um, I've written a note here, need to test more values, like a pretty broad range that I want to sort of narrow in on. I think I was just grabbing whatever, you know, uh, 0805 capacitors I happen to have on hand. Um, and so I, I want to try a broader range, but 560 puff seemed to work for the range of um, uh, video speeds that I was working with. I've got 100 ohms here. Two question marks means I don't really know whether that's optimal, but it seemed to work. And likewise, for this filter here, I've got one mic there, 220 ohms there, which gives you a minus uh, 3D high pass filter at 732 hertz. So way, way, way down low end. Um, basically just you know trying to get rid of DC. Again, these values were determined by what I had on hand. Um, and yeah, that's sort of the, the basics behind how this circuit works. You can see in my diagram, A, it's, it's a lot messier. I have not reproduced that symbol very well. And here I've got the AD8037 um, with the V high and V low um, clipping coming in. Um, all the other stuff here is, is pretty straightforward. Decoupling caps um, on these guys. Uh, and I've got the gain set for this. So here's my 274 ohm um, uh, resistor in the feedback path here. I've got a 1K pot on the low side. That's how you adjust gain. General tip, don't put anything with long leads, like potentiometers in the feedback path. Um, you wanna keep this as close and tight on the PCB as possible. Um, so that this matching is matched with the characteristics of the PCB. So, you know, put that over here. Um, yeah, what else is there to say? Low value resistors are good. Generally in life, especially when you're dealing with high precision signals, you've got, uh, is it Johnson noise? Josephson noise? One of the two. Um, thermal noise from, from higher resistors. So lower resistor values are good. Um, but yeah, hopefully this video is under half an hour long and is educational in some way. Sorry for not preparing a script. Sorry for the very cute puppy in the background. He's being noisy. Uh, but see you next time. Bye.